um, 12. Welcome, everybody, um, to the last day of DebConf. My talk's about uh, Postgres, QL, and Debian. Who doesn't know what Postgres is? Who knows Postgres? OK, good. Who knows it's a database system. So I'm giving this talk uh, together. Or I'm, I put up uh, Christopher Burke as a co-author because he wrote some of the slides. Um, I took quite a, a bit, like two or three slides from his presentation at uh, Heidelberg. And also because he's uh, one of the, if you see here, that's, that's him, that's uploaders to, from the package PostgreSQL team. So he's doing a lot of work in the last couple of years, being the most prominent uh, maintainer uh, of Postgres and Postgres-related packages. So package PostgreSQL is the team that maintains the Postgres database server, but also um, quite a lot of extensions and uh, associated projects. So Christopher Burke is a colleague of mine, and Adrian von Entrich is another colleague of mine who has been doing quite a few work uh, last year and this year. And uh, Michael Meskes is boss of mine, who's also been doing a couple of uploads. And so I actually have only uploaded two packages for now. But I'm doing a lot of work with Postgres um, during my day job at Creative. <clears throat> we are supporting Postgres and doing consulting on it. But that's, that's the reason why Christoph is credited as a co-author. So I first want to give a small overview of what Postgres is and what's new in Postgres since um, the Jesse release. So now that Stretch is released, what's, what happens between Jesse and Stretch? And then I want to give a short overview about how the Postgres database server packages are structured and are, you can use them as a user, but then also how you can actually develop or package PostgreSQL extensions for Debian. And if there's enough time, there's a slight product thing that we did in, at Creative, which I might be able to show at the end. We'll see. So from an overview perspective, Postgres is an extensional object relational database system. Extensible means the user can define new data types and even operators between the data types or even new indexes since the last release. So it's, it can be extended by the, by the user by creating extensions. There's hundreds of extensions for all types of data types, IPv4 addresses, geographical um, units, everything. It was created as an academic project, the successor to Ingress at Berkeley, and it got open sourced in the 90s, first as Postgres 95, and when they decided to add the SQL language, which wasn't the case originally, they decided to call it PostgreSQL, and now they regret it because it's a rather unwieldy name. So you're fine to, you to call it Postgres. Just don't call it Postgre or something like that. Postgres is fine. Um, what is important compared to other uh, popular free software um, database systems, it's vendor neutral. It's, um, it's um, still commercial support there from quite a few companies, including us. But uh, there is no vendor actually um, keeping tap on, on the whole, whole thing, right? And there's this Postgres Global Development Group, which is kind of not a very uh, legal organization. It's just the, the group of, like the Debian project, basically, I would say, um, of people uh, working on Postgres. And uh, the, the copyright of the Postgres database server is at that group which I don't believe is a legal entity, so it's a bit shaky, but still. And there's a five-member core team, and they have a release team now, which is kind of important because they didn't have in the last couple of years. But for the last two releases, they have a release team, which keeps, keeps tabs on open items, and that's working pretty well so far. And they're on a re yearly release cycle, but it's kind of like Debian in a sense. It's a free space, so the freeze is always in um, February or March when they release a beta, and then over summer they stabilize. And then it takes more or longer, uh, longer or lesser until the final release is done, and there was some problems that it took until the next year, so they decided to have this release team. Now they have it. It will probably be, there was just a beta 3 announced for the next version, and it will probably uh, happen in September or October. Um, what's also important is that there used to be the major minor version thing where the major version was 9.3, 9.4, 9.5, 9.6. Uh, 
And now they switch to 10 as the next major version, and then will be 11 afterwards, so they drop the third digit. So, so there will be 10, and the first patch release will be 10.0, or the initial release, the first patch release will be 10.1, 10.2, and um, so on. So they maintain upstream all branches, all releases for five years. Um, and they have quarterly patch releases, which are very um, easy to figure out. There was one just two days ago, and it's every three months on the, the last, or prob no, in this time, probably first Thursday of, of the quarter. So we just had one. There will be another one in autumn and another one in, in winter. What's also important is that those patch releases are um, strictly bug fix releases, no new features. They make try to really be careful about not um, adding any regressions in it, and so they're basically whitelisted by the stable release team in the sense that we just upload the patch releases. We don't backport specific fixes, we just upload the patch release to Debian stable. And there's actually usually quite a few bug fixes, like 20 maybe. There's also no copyright assignments. I already said it's, it's a Postgres global development group, but you just, so you're not allowed to assert your copyright, but there's also no copyright assignments, you don't give it up. And there's certainly no open core in the sense that the main system is BSD licensed and there's no open core. There might be some companies who have proprietary um, software or forks on it that's are fine with everybody there because it's a BSD license and they're very BSD centric, so they're probably fine with it. But in general, it's a BSD license, no open core, no dual licensing, nothing. Render neutral. That's the main point. From an um, legal point of view or, or community point of view, I would say. Now, from the feature point of view, most people consider Postgres from the beginning, or mostly from the beginning, they stabilized very quickly in the 90s to be rock solid, so you, it's probably not going to eat your data. There have been some rare bugs, mostly during a replication, which has, which has been added eight, nine years ago, uh, but they have been shaken out. It has a good, consistent coverage of the SQL standard. There's no a lot of gotchas like, why? Why is it doing this this way, and the next command does it that way? And there's a useful modern additions to it, which might now also be an SQL standard, but it's pretty, pretty good SQL. If you, if you like writing SQL, Postgres is usually a good, good database, and you would, you would like doing it. There, as I already said, there's a large number of extensions and associated projects in the hundreds these years. Um, the, the extension system got integrated actually with uh, Wheezy, with 9.1. And since then, a lot of extensions have, have shown up, and it's, it's very easy to, to create an extension database. Also, what's important for some people, or maybe not, it, it's transactional changes to the database system. So you can roll back uh, schema changes uh, if, they don't, if there's a problem, and you have several schema changes, and um, one thing makes an error, you can roll back the whole thing. You don't have to start over or fair, like tidy up yourself afterwards. You don't get to keep both case, uh, pieces. And there's many drivers for programming languages. There's many uh, different procedural languages, so you can write it in all kinds of languages. R, Java, Node, whatever. And the final thing that I want to stress, maybe that's also because it's rather recent, so you might not know, is that there's also a lot of foreign data wrappers, it's called, for federated access to other databases, or Postgres itself, which is also a major use case. So you can, um, you can say, okay, this is a foreign server, and it has these and these tables, and then you just can query them locally. And this can be an Oracle database, this can be a MySQL database, or it can be a whatever database. And you can even run write queries on it. And it's getting better and better. And um, certainly the Postgres one is, is pretty advanced, so you can do um, advanced things, and start, they start building sharding and, and these kinds of um, projects on top of it. <clears throat> and finally, it's packaged in Debian. So. I'll get to the package in Debian in a bit. Um, as I said, 9.1 was um, Wheezy, 9.4 Jesse, and 9.6 is going to be stretched. So just a quick rundown of the changes that happened since Jesse, if you haven't looked at it yet. So in 9.5, there's one thing which a lot of developers love is upsert. It's called insert on conflict update ignore. And what, uh, what's also, I think, important is role level security. So you can um, 
tell the database, okay, only show this row to a user if he matches a certain criteria, he or she. Um, there's block range indexes. I don't want to go through all this, but if you're interested, we can, you can ask questions and I'm trying to answer them. Analytic queries, rewinding old masters, setting unlocked or locked, so not um, replicated tables for, for, for performance. And you can import whole schemas now from other databases via foreign data wrappers. You just import the schema. You don't have to set up the same tables, make sure it's the same tables on your local as on the remote server. And it's always improving in scalability, actually. So since 9.1 or 9.2, the Postgres developers have made sure that more and more uh, multi-core systems can be used for um, single queries. So that means that you can have lots of queries in parallel, and they use all the cores. And since uh, 9.6, you can also use parallel queries. So in Stretch, you be, you're able to um, run a query, and it will run if there are certain um, requirements met, it will run in parallel on a number of cores. That's mostly useful for sequential scans, but it will be improved in the next version, and there's quite a huge improvements in some, some benchmarks to that. It still has to be worked on. It's, it's an incremental thing, but, but it's there, and it's going to be only better. Also, Wacom has, to, has been improved dramatically, so this Wacom freeze problems that some people had when there is a wraparound of the transaction counter, and basically everything stops because Postgres has the vacuum. That has been vastly improved in 9.6. You can do a consistent reads from, from standby, so you always know if you write something on the master and immediately read it from the standby, it will, be, it will be the same thing with some performance penalty. But that's important if you do load balancing on, on reading. And uh, yeah, as I said, the Postgres foreign data wrapper interface gets better, improved scalability. Um, so I just want to quickly run down, because that's maybe the, the least you know, the, what's going to happen in 10, which is the next major release, which will happen in, as I said, autumn. So the main, what, the main things are it will have logical replication, finally. So until now, there was physical replication, which meant you have to replicate the whole cluster block by block, basically. And that implies that you cannot replicate just one database out of several or just a couple of tables. And it also implies that you always have to have the same version of the operating system and Postgres. So you cannot just replicate from 9.1 to 9.4 or from Jesse to Stretch uh, in order to upgrade, uh, because it has to be the same version. So with logical replication, you are able to replicate to another Postgres server, which runs a different version. And um, this will be, hopefully, one of the things which makes people first possible to do major upgrades much easier. But also, there's lots of other suit ca uh, use cases um, in order to just change, capture some data from, for changes and, and, and something like that, stream changes. There's lots of things people will be able to, to work with that. I mean, the, the infrastructure has been there since 9.4, so there are third-party external extensions, which I also will get to later, to, for do like logical replication. But this will be in core now. It will be, you can run create publication, um, blah, blah, blah. And also, there will be extended parallel query. I already said that. So now indexes are also in parallel. And there will be um, native partitioning, which might also be important for some people uh, who have huge databases. So they will be able to partition them natively. And there will be um, some things. It will also be um, imp improved in the next couple of years. But this is also the beginning of native partitioning. I will not go through really the other ones, because I have a couple of more slides I want to show on other things. But those, were the, those are the major features uh, in, in, um, in 10. Uh, just a few extensions, which are also new, which I uh, looked up. And this is alphabetically. Um, CIDUS is basically, they used to be a proprietary web scale sharding thing. And now they decided that the extension architecture of the Postgres is so great that they can unfork. So now it's, it's just an extension, and they also open source it at the same time. So you, can, you have several Postgres clusters. You, you create this CITUS extension, and then you have sharding and distributed joins on top of it, which is a pretty um, powerful thing to have. Um, PG Partment now a bit not, I mean, it's still useful, but now that we have partitioning, maybe not so much, but it's a partition manager which does the lifting which you could do before with lots of functions and inheritance and whatever. You could implement partitioning before, and PG Partment is helping with that for, for a lot. 
but as I said, now there is native partitioning. Uh, repack will repack or reorganize your, your tables if they become bloated on the fly, so you don't have to recreate the table with locks and anything. PG Backrest is a heavy duty backup and restore thing like Barman, which is used um, quite, is quite popular these days. And uh, I just want to shout out SQL Smith because a colleague of mine who wrote it and he's, he found like several dozen bucks in, in Postgres due to it. He's just um, randomly generating SQL queries and basically fuzzing the, the, the parser and then extensions. So he found quite a few um, bucks with that. And, and that was also very helpful for quality assurance of, of the Postgres server. And not in, um, not in Stretch, but their sin stretch is uh, PG logical. That's the external logical replication solution I was talking about. Um, PG audit, which is an auditing extension, so you can say, okay, I want to, uh, I want to lock when somebody uh, touches this table, but only if they touch the password uh, column on it, and I want to have that locked or things like that. And uh, finally, BG background this background worker REPL status is a small project, but might be useful. It just tells you via a HTTP port, is this, a, is this a standby or a primary? So it's useful to, for tooling of um, replicated systems. So that's basically it for the part about what's new. Now, how is Postgres in Debian? That's the next thing I want to talk about. And um, the plan is simple. There's Debian, there's Postgres, package it, done. But the problem with that is, um, we don't have just Debian, we don't have just Postgres. There's um, SID, Stretch, Jesse, Wheezy, and we have five, as I said, every Postgres major release is supported for five years, so basically there's five different versions in, in support. And people, I mean, some people are using Postgres as a backend for a small thing, and they don't mind if it's going down during app get upgrade or not, but some people are using it for their business critical um, applications. and. Um, just upgrading Postgres with, uh, with a Debian upgrade, and then suddenly there is some breakage, and everything's down, and you have to fix it. It's not what they want. So they might want to stick with um, 9.4 in Stretch for a while until they figure it out, OK, this is how we did it. Um, this is OK. Now we can upgrade. Or they have some ven legacy vendor applications which still run on 9.1, and the vendor says, no, 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 you cannot upgrade it, but they really want to upgrade at least the operating system. So there's these problems. Um, and the main, I mean, this is written here, so the underlying reason you cannot just easily upgrade is on this format changes. So you always have to do something for an upgrade. It's either a dump restore, you can try now um, to do an in-place upgrade, which still has some downtime, but works most of the time, and is rather quick. Or you can use one of the logical replication solutions by my, like replicating everything to another cluster and then changing your application to um, to look at the new cluster. Yeah. So as I said, you need both versions, and um, it takes a lot of disk space. So what the PostgreSQL maintainers came up with is um, the so-called PostgreSQL common framework. Yeah, sorry. Uh, when you say major release, it's not from 9 to 10, but from 9.1 to 9.2? Exactly, yeah. So major releases used to be it's always used to be 9.1, 9.2, 9.3. Those are all major releases. And 10 is also a major release. So from 10 on, it will be 10, 11, 12. But those are the major releases. So 9.1, 12, that's the patch level. So from 9.1, so to make clear, if you're at, at 9.1, 12, and Postgres, uh, Debian, or somebody else releases um, 9.1, 13, that's just a restart. So you have to restart your, you, you install the new packages, and you restart. That's also a bit of a downtime. Everybody has to stop using database server. You can go around with bouncers and things to have that more useful. But still, that's just a restart. You don't have to dump your 10 terabyte database for one hour and then reload it for three hours and have lots of downtime. It's just a restart. But for a major release, you have to do something. So that's why we have um, PostgreSQL Common, which makes all these um, Postgres servers and versions co-installable. And uh, they're creating, it's a, basically a wrapper around the Postgres, uh, upstream Postgres commands, and they're creating uh, database clusters. And um, that's cool, but still we have the problem that in Debian we only support one major version per Debian release. So we have 9.6 in Stretch, 9.4 in Wheezy, and maybe, as I said, users might want to have 
several versions for testing, or they still need an old version, uh, that kind of stuff. So what's there in addition for users, and what Christoph worked a lot on, is the app.postgresql.org um, package repository. There's one for RPMs as well. But I'm only talking about apt. So it's, uh, it's basically uh, organized and architected by Christoph as part of the package PostgreSQL uh, Debian team, but it's run by upstream Postgres development, global development group in their namespace. And it's an app repository, and we are rebuilding all Postgres servers and extension packages in all their versions for all Debian and some Ubuntu versions. So right now we have 126 targets. Yeah, we, we support seven Debian and Ubuntu releases on three architectures. So we kind of recently added um, PowerPC 64. And for all the, the, well, five to six Postgres releases. So 10 is kind of better right now, but it's still there if you want to test it. You can already do it there. I think 10 is in experimental as far as Debian is concerned, right? So we have around 160 source package we build, and this is uh, done with uh, Debian Jenkins Clue. And uh, just to give you an idea is, um, I believe, that's the number of packages. So it's at, OK, now I'm, I'm getting, I think that's the number of files, actually, 18,000 in the, in, the, in the archive these days. And um, the other ones are, you have to look at the left one, uh, like number of, of Debian uh, file names is around 900. And uh, that's probably the number of source packages. So it's almost 200, like 180. So it's, it's increasing uh, steadily. And we're adding new versions and new things. And there is a lot of things. So if you want to use as a, um, as a user, you want to use any version, go to app.postgresql.org. There is a wiki there explaining which app sources list you have to add. And then you can just go. And those are all tested, which I will get to a bit later. But usually, we rerun all the, the um, integration tests. So there is a pretty good chance that they are working. I mean, we obviously don't test um, all these 1,000 packages manually, but they're automatically tested via, via Jenkins. So, and, and we fix the test suite failures. So that's for if you want to run any kind of version on anything. But there's also the long-term support thing. So um, what, if you, what if you want to run, for some reason, you're still stuck, or used to be still stuck on squeeze, and you still need Postgres. So, that's the other thing, and um, the, main, the main point is that upstream support ended roughly when Squeeze LTS began. So there was no more, when Squeeze happened, or when Squeeze LTS happened, so there was no more upstream support. They also stopped it because it was five years old. And what, what we did at Credit Chief, we decided to keep the, an LTS branch of Postgres 8.4 um, maintained and backport all the patches which are applicable. Like most, some of them, or quite a few, weren't applicable, but some were. Um, in order to, to support or contribute to the squeeze LTS effort. So that was, we backported around 250 commits. And only a few of them were security commits. But we did that. And we, we released six upstream versions, 8.4.22, which was the last patch release, LTS 1 to LTS 6. So that's, that's here on that GitHub repository. You can still, there's a pg84 underscore LTS branch. And um, yeah, we stopped, we stopped doing it when squeeze LTS stopped, um, was end of life a while ago. But, but we did all that work. On the other hand, um, I have to say that we didn't really get a lot of feedback. So nobody was like, oh, great, you're, support, you're backporting all these little bug fixes. Uh, it's super great. So we did the work as a proof of concept. But we decided for Wheezy, it's probably not all that worth it. So for Wheezy, um, which ships 9.1 and upstream support also ended last September, we decided to only backport the security fixes for now. I mean, if somebody's really interested in that, um, on a, they have a business and their business depends on it or something, please come talk to me. But for now, we decided as on a community basis to only do that for security uploads. So the first security upload in, in January, uh, sorry, the first patch release in January didn't have any security uploads. And the second one in May, we fixed uh, now. So it's now fixed. It took us a while, but we caught up. And actually, we released the um, DLA 1051 uh, during DevConf. So now it's 
as I said, there was just a patch release on Thursday, and those security fixes are now also in Weezy LTS. That's the LTS part I wanted to talk about. And now a bit more about how the package is actually structured, how is uh, PostgreSQL.com actually structured. I already mentioned that there is multiple major versions that you co-install. And we call, in Postgres, that's a bit of a problem, but you call an instance is the same name as a cluster. These days, clusters are usually uh, con considered something which is a replicated system with a primary and standby. But cluster in this uh, context means an instance. And uh, we identify them by name and version. And um, every new instance gets an incremental port, starting from 5432. So I'm not sure this will work very well, but I can try to maybe give a small demo. No, OK, that seems to be whatever. Then let's skip that. So the, it, what's important to know is that the server packages are called PostgreSQL-version, like 9.1, 9.4. And um, these are the, basically the, the um, directories where you, where you should look for stuff. So the database files are in wallet PostgreSQL, which it's also configurable, but that's the default. And the log files are in var log. And the configuration files are in etc PostgreSQL. So it's kind of the Debian standard. Um, I think the RPM packages are doing it a bit differently, because upstream likes to keep the configuration in the data directory, but Debian removes them into, into etc. And they're um, in a version um, versioned directory. And in there, you have PostgreSQL conf, which is the main Postgres server configuration file. And you have the pghba conf, which configures which users are allowed to connect to Postgres from which addresses or sockets to which databases. And pgident conf, which is for ident uh, mapping, which is not used a lot these days. But you also have pgcontrol conf and start conf, which are Debian specific. So in, in those, you're able to uh, add additional options about what to do when pgcontrol which is the main start-stop thing in, in Postgres works, or whether to, in startconf, you can configure um, whether a cluster should automatically start on boot up, or whether it should be started manually, or whether it should be disabled at all. Um, the other thing that PostgreSQL.com provides is a wrapper. So there is a thing called PG wrapper, and it, it wraps around the client binaries for, uh, and it selects a default cluster and version that you should target, which is usually um, the main version and the first cluster. But you can tell him, so example, we patch PSQL or PG wrapper is having this additional option cluster where you can um, select a cluster and then PSQL, which is the main command line tool, will connect to that cluster. If you don't use edit, it's going to add to, uh, it's going to connect to the main cluster. And you can add an environment variable, or you can set up your own um, PostgreSQL for your default cluster. Uh, and you can even have this user clusters thing in etc PostgreSQL.com where, uh, where you can configure a default cluster for each user. And then there's a couple of PG cluster commands which wrap around the upstream Postgres commands. Basically, create cluster, drop cluster, which work as you would expect. You can rename the clusters. You can list all the clusters, which is one I wanted to show, but it, the, oh, sorry, I didn't get a terminal up. And PG control cluster, which is the main uh, thing for starting and stopping clusters. Finally, PG upgrade cluster can upgrade a cluster. It, can, it, does, a do, it does do a dump restore by default, but you can also run it in place. So there is an option that uh, allows you to run an in-place upgrade, which makes the whole thing much more, much faster. And finally, pgconf tool is a nice tool to read and edit parameters in a configuration file for, for tooling and, and, and scripts and stuff. So you don't have to rely on VI or, or some additional shell scripting. During cluster creation, which maybe also not everybody knows, you can actually um, configure very fine-grade what, what Debian should do with your Postgres clusters. 
So you can, thanks, you can um, tell it whether or not to automatically create a main cluster if it installs a new major version. It, some people are annoyed by that, so you can remove that actually. It's, it's all in uh, at etc postgresql.com create cluster. Um, StartConf, I already mentioned, that's the main one, um, where the auto manual are disabled. So that's just the, the um, system-wide default for the StartConf, which is in every etc PostgreSQL version cluster directory. You can also tell it to um, put the transaction logs somewhere else if you want to do that, and it will automatically symlink them in in the database, um, database directory and add some inner DB options. So for example, one thing which, my, which is not there by default is data checksums, because there is a small performance overhead. But data checksums makes sure that the data you write to the disk and, and Postgres reads is actually consistent. And there is no, so Postgres can then uh, detect hidden um, hardware problems with, with the data being written to disk. So that's something that you might want to um, enable. And you can also add there parameters which get written into the PostgreSQL.conf during cluster start. So if you have some default parameters, so for example, the, the default PostgreSQL.conf um, configuration file is not tuned for huge installations. It's supposed to be working on a notebook, for example, so be usable for about everybody. So if you have really huge databases, it makes sense to, to increase some of the um, performance and tuning limits. So you can do this here uh, as a default, and it gets automatically uh, included if you create a new cluster. Now that's about it uh, I wanted to talk about from a user perspective. Now, just a few more slides, um, how to actually build extensions and uh, projects for Postgres if you're interested, because there's lots of extensions and certainly not all of them are, are packaged. And if you're, if you're working with Postgres and there is an extension that you really want to see packaged for easier inclusion, uh, this is how it works. It's rather easy, and you can join a package PostgreSQL team. So PostgreSQL-DOM common also provides something called pg underscore build x for build extension. It helps building packages for multiple Postgres versions. So it basically loops over uh, the versions that you can provide in Debian slash pg versions in the source package directory. So you can say there, everything from 9.2 is supported, or everything from 9.5 is supported. And then if you build it locally, it will, it will build packages for all of those. If you build it on a Debian auto builder, it will only build packages for the default version in Debian, which is 9.6 right now for, for stretch. And also, the supported versions are generally um, defined by this. So this will be 9.6 for, for Debian stable release. But for example, on this infrastructure of app postgresql.org, all the versions that is supported by that um, infrastructure are there. So automatically, packages for all the different uh, Postgres versions are built from build X. There's a couple of examples in, in the main, main file. And uh, the Debian rules looks like this. You include this um, control make file snippet. And basically, you just run build X with the proper uh, argument for, for building, uh, testing not. We do auto package test and installing. And this, is the, uh, this will get um, substituted for the version that, that PG build X figured out would be used or built. So it's rather actually rather simple. So this, this probably works for already for quite a few uh, extensions just as is. You might have to add something or tweak it a bit, but, but this is the, the skeleton which, which actually works for rather well as a starting point for building package extensions. So it's, it's not, not a big deal. Yeah? You have to write a Debian control file. You have to copy this over, check that it works, and almost done. Don't forget the copyright. Um, as I just mentioned, we are using auto package tests. So we are trying to test the packages um, at its stall time, so from the actual package that gets created. There's been a lot of talks about auto package tests at DevConf, so I don't want to get into how it works on a technical level. But that's um, a thing. So PostgreSQL common already has uh, over 1,000 tests for, for PostgreSQL 9.4 or 9.6. 
that are doing all the kinds of things that po these PG cluster commands are doing. So there's a, lot, there's a huge test suite that Debian actually wrote for, for Postgres clusters. And then there's, of course, also the upstream test suites that are, that are being run in, in that, um, during that thing. So for a package, um, for, a, for a PostgreSQL server package, we run all the upstream test suites. Um, and um, just so the integration with PG Build X, I want to quickly get into. Then you, this is the auto package testing. Yeah, you have Debian test control. It runs test suite, and there's build depends. And basically, um, it just goes there and runs. So this is for PostgreSQL um, common. And as you can see, this is, this is an output where it, it's running that for 9.4. Um, if you want to do it for an extension, which might be more interesting, usually we run make install check, which is an upstream target that all most of the packages and most of the extensions provide in their make file via this Postgres extension framework. And then we have a very simple Debian test install check, which just runs build, PG build X install check. And PG build X takes care to actually start up a Postgres uh, server cluster, installing the extension, and running the test suite of the extension, and checking that everything's fine. And you can have it a bit more complicated if, for example, you only want to have, um, you don't want to run it on several ser versions, then you can just continue in that case, otherwise, uh, run the build install X. So that's Roughly about what I wanted to talk in terms of creating extensions. It's rather easy, so please help us if you're interested. I and mean, Christoph is quite overloaded. And um, on the other hand, we are looking at uh, so so at this point we looked at which are important extensions. So for example, I package PG Logical and PG Audit because I thought they're they're important extensions that we should have. And we are looking at which extensions or um, data types are used in the big um, cloud offerings like Google Compute Engine or Azure or Amazon. What, what are they doing? If there's anything missing that, De that Debian doesn't have, that they have, we also would package it, I guess. But there's, as I said, there's hundreds. So we are not going to package everything just because it's a Postgres extension. If you have a particular need, file an RFP bug, request for packaging, and we look at it, or package it yourself and uh, let us know. So finally, um, I wanted to talk about something we um, did in the last couple of weeks, I would say, with, uh, together with Thomas Cran. It's a, it's a company, and it's a Postgres appliance. It's heavily based on PostgreSQL Common. So basically, what you see here is, is kind of a webified output of PGLS clusters. Can you see that? It's maybe a bit too small. So basically, um, we're offering an appliance, and the, Thomas Cran is offering the hardware and um, the hardware support, and we're doing the, the software and the, the software support if needed. And you can uh, buy those and um, get this web front end to your Postgres cluster. So it basically, as I said, there's a, right now here there's three clusters. They're all online, and there's buttons to uh, get to the service files, so you can start or stop them. Uh, you can go to the log files, and you can check the backup and the log reports. So this is done through integration with a couple of packages uh, that you can see here, um, which is uh, PG Admin 4 for a web-based administration. So PG Admin 3 used to be the main um, thing that people were using for administrating or for GUI administrating Postgres clusters. The new version, PG Admin 4, is web-based. It's not in Debian yet because there's lots of Python um, dependencies, so we haven't managed to package them all. But um, we are working on it, so that, that will be uh, one of the things we're contributing in that terms. And then we use uh, Grafana for, as a monitoring dashboard um, backed by Prometheus. And we use PG Badger, which is in Debian, as a log file analyzer. PG Backrest, I just mentioned that this is new in Stretch, is used for, for backups. And Cockpit is generally used to, for system upgrades. So uh, Martin Pitt has recently um, implemented uh, system upgrades in Cockpit. Cockpit is a Red Hat uh, project, but it works with uh, Debian-based systems. And we are also using it to start and stop the services and uh, show the log files and stuff. And finally, there's Shell in the Box, which is a neat tool. So you can just click on that, click on that thing here, and you get a shell in your web browser in, on, on that appliance if you need to debug something on the, on the command line. And just, just so you get an uh, idea, this is how the, the Corfana dashboard looks like. Um, so there's a couple of dashboards. Um, 
CPU, just want to click through this, a couple of um, graphs. And um, we're currently deploying it via Vagrant. If you want to first try it yourself, I mean, the, um, we haven't pushed it to GitHub yet, I think. Um, I have to check. But if you're interested in it, talk to me. And um, it's called Elephant Chat uh, internally. So there's a couple of Elephant Chat packages which do all the systemd integration and other setup and dropping configuration files in, in the punct point D uh, directories. So you get the integration. And in general, you can check the packages already uh, from packagescreative.com, but they're kind of better right now. So take care. But if you're interested, you can look at this. This is the app leak key for it. So that's basically it that I wanted to talk about. Are there any questions? Look, thanks for maintaining the Postgres packages. Um, I've been using them as a dependency for other things, including um, Postbooks and now um, Reciprocate. Um, in Reciprocate, I've added um, upstream, I've added Postgres support. Um, so I'm using Postgres tables now for things like users. Nice. Um, so we've got a, a few different backends. And I was looking at merging the code for different databases and using an abstraction layer or something. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that for upstream developers who want to use Postbooks, but don't, sorry, uh, Postgres, but don't want to code directly to the Postgres API. Um, would you have any suggestions? Yeah, preferably things that are packaged already or things that could be packaged. Well, I think it mostly depends on which programming language your thing is. So there's SQL Alchemy for Python C++ stuff. C++. C++. Yeah. Or C. Well, there's the first. Um, so if you're doing Java, then Hibernate or something like that would be an obvious abstraction layer. But I'm not, I'm not a C++ coder, so unfortunately, I'm not super sure. I mean, we can talk about that later. I can have, I can have a look. But I don't know offhand what's a very useful thing. I mean, what? What is it using right now as a database abstraction? Is there any database abstraction layer at all, or is it just running SQL queries? No, it's just going straight to the Postgres API and running queries. Mm. So yeah, I'm familiar with the Java world and Hibernate and what have you. Um, I've seen a few different C++ abstraction layers, like not a full object mapping layer, but just a, a a way to like things like the Unix ODBC, but the licensing on that isn't compatible with every C++ project. Okay. I'm so. right. Yeah. Also, I mean, it depends. Usually, there's obviously an abstraction layer, so lowest common denominator. Denominator. Um, so you're losing some of the stuff you might get with Postgres, depending on what you're doing. If it's very advanced analytics or things, or you want to. Do you, do you want to have some of the um, intelligence in the database by running stored procedures? That's usually not possible when you're using abstraction layer. So then, of the, on the other hand, I don't want to tell you you should only use Postgres. So if, if you want to keep it open to, to other projects, then obviously you need to either support everything, like you have to code everything for every database, or you need to have an abstraction layer. Yeah, that's unfortunate. OK, thanks. Is there another question? Yeah. You mentioned a new replication system that's logical rather than physical. Is this intended as a replacement for the existing replication system or as an alternative that both will be maintained in parallel? Certainly both will be maintained in parallel upstream for a while to come. I mean, the, um, the physical replication works very well. It's very easy to set up. And um, it's faster than logical replication, but not by a lot. So there used to be trigger-based logical replications, and that's very slow compared to physical replication. Logical replication is pretty fast. It scales to quite a few cores. But it's, it's performance-wise still a trade-off. Um, usually what people were using logical replication before was either major upgrades, so replicate everything and then move over, or they were using it to only replicate parts of it. If you want to anyway replicate everything, probably physical replication, it's going to stay. Because basically what physical replication does is just uh, streaming over the transaction logs 
to the standby, and the standby is applying them. So there is no, I mean, they'd anyway have to generate those transaction logs for crash recovery and, and backup purposes. So they're not going to throw that away. It's going to stay. I don't think there is a, I mean, there is some maintenance burden, but it's so useful that uh, physical replication, I'm pretty sure, will be there for the next couple of years at least. So, and there is certainly no talk about removing it at this point. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes. OK. So I think we're running out of time anyway. Do we have more questions? We still might have time for one, if there is any. Hi. With logical replication, can you just uh, uh, make a replication of one, ta one table, for example? Yes. You can. Um, you can tell it to only replicate one table, yeah. I mean, the, actually, with the PG Logical project, there is a new version out where you can even tell it to only replicate parts of a table, if you want. So there is a where condition you can add, I think. And but with the internal 10 uh, logical replication, I believe um, you can either tell it to, to replicate all the tables or um, so basically it's a, a publication subscribers thing, and you have a set. And the default set will be all tables in the database or in the schema. But I believe it's, easy, it's possible to only tell it, OK, this set is only this table. And you can also tell it to, um, so you can have several standbys, and they subscribe to different things. So one would replicate only this table. Another one would replicate only another table. But if you have the same table in several sets, that's not a bottle performance. Over, so it's not going to replicate the whole thing several times. Okay, then you can do bidirectional uh, replication. No, you cannot, well, you can do it, but it will break, yeah. So, I mean, what you can do w right now with logical replication is you, ha you can write on the standby. So, I mean, I didn't get into details with that, but with physical replication, you can only do reads from the standby. It's called hot standby. With logical replication, you can write. But, of, but there is no internal thing right now which makes sure that you don't write over stuff which on the primary is different. There is a, called a bidirectional replication project by a company um, called Second Quadrant. And um, they are, so they are also implemented most of the logical replication stuff. So, and certainly the end point at some point will be bidirectional replication as a, like, it's not master master, but it's, it's useful asynchronous or synchronous, let's see, a bidirectional replication. So you have two data centers and you can actually do writes on both. But certainly there has to be some um, transaction, either some transaction uh, manager or there has to be some conflict resolution last wins or whatever, then so that they, they don't get out of sync. And this is not in core. So you can look at the BDR project if you're interested. Um, but I believe they went to a open core type of model recently. So take it with a grain of salt. But it will come in the next year. So this is, so 9.4 got logical uh, change set decoding, change data capture. And um, 10 gets logical replication. And as with physical replication, it will get improved in the next version. Um, there is a several limitations now, I think. There is um, failover for standbys is not working, I believe. So if, the failover, if you need to failover on a standby, you have to do that manually and re, uh, rebalance things. And so I'm not sure it's, I mean, I wouldn't bet my business on, on the upstream logical replication right now. But certainly to, to look at it and to, and to check it out, it's, it's there and it's useful. And it will be in 10, as I said. OK. Thank you. OK, I think we're running out of time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.